Welcome to Movie Night Spotlight. I'm your host, Dave Lindsay, and I am joined once again by Liam O'Leary. What's up, Diggity? How's it going, sir? Not bad. How are you, sir? Doing well. Watch any uh, interesting movies you want to just kick off with a, a brief review of something you've watched recently? or uh, Outside of today's movie, no. <laughs> no? No, <laughs> not, not recently. I've been meaning to. I've been watching a lot of Psych. I've been watching some uh, Suits. Show. It is hilarious. How is Suits? I haven't watched that one yet. I kind of like it. it. It actually gives me a slightly better impression of lawyers than I had before, which was not very good. <laughs> but only slightly. Only slightly. Well, only, only slightly. Yeah. Did you see this past week's psych when they go back to 2006? I've recorded it. I haven't watched it yet. It was pretty fun and like how he, how he cracks it. It's, man, it, it, it's a good episode. It's got Ralph Macchio, so... Can't, go, Can't wrong. go wrong there. No. But anyway, you, sir, are quite possibly the biggest James Bond fan that I know. Maybe not in the world. I'm sure there's a bigger Bond fanatic in the world. But at least out of everyone I know, you take the cake on that one. Thank you, sir. Uh, what first got you in, interested in the character before we jump into the uh, particular movie, and I, subsequently we'll get into that. I'm sure you'll bring up tidbits from the book as well, but before we jump into that, what got you into the character to begin with? Um, it, it might seem kind of odd to people out there who have been Bond fans for, you know, longer than this, but I feel like it's, it's, uh, it's something that might be kind of relevant for, you know, people of our age group. What got me started was GoldenEye for the N64. Not even the movie, the video game. It was it was the game. The game got me into the movie. The movie got me into the... Uh, you know, made me realize that there's a much bigger Bond universe. And then when I realized that there were books, I, my mind was blown. It was like 98. It was like, what? I, hadn't, I didn't know. And it just kind of opened my, my eyes to a wider world. Right. I remember GoldenEye was, my I think, my first introduction to Bond as well. I don't think my dad had any of the movies or anything like that. Um, saw Sean Connery and Hunt for Red October, but that's, I think, the closest I got to a Bond movie, which is far from... Well, it's Jack Ryan, so it's... It's, uh, it, it's, it's espionage. It's yeah. in the same... And it's got universe. Sean Connery, but yeah, you know, it's still... It's different enough, too. Uh, we know, same thing. Um, I remember GoldenEye in the mid-'90s being jealous of all the N64 owners because I had a PlayStation instead of an N64... So I was so pumped when Tomorrow Never Dies was coming out on PlayStation. I'm like, oh, this is going to be our golden eye, and it wasn't. It was terrible. I wouldn't say it was terrible. It was fun, but because I couldn't compare it to golden eye, maybe that's why I thought it was okay. I thought it was fun, but... Trust me. I can compare it to golden eye. It was terrible. Fair enough. So I figured you're you know, a big James Bond fan. Let's jump in. It was going to happen once or what? Or... It's going to happen eventually that we discuss Bond on here. Figured why not jump in, and I asked you what movie you'd like to start off with, and you picked Dr. No. Yes. 1962, the first Bond movie, but not the first Bond book. Correct. And uh, why did you uh, want to start at the very beginning instead of something more recent? Like, uh, I know you're a big uh, Casino Royale fan. I absolutely um, love that movie. Bond with GoldenEye, like you were saying before, you know, for the movie that got both of us into the character, but you picked Dr. No. Was there any particular reason other than it started at all? or? Um, well, A, it is the one that, that started the whole thing. Um, you know, it was kind of on the strength of this that the series was allowed to be a series. Fleming had always wanted it to be a series. You know, when they were first filming it, he had always wanted it to be a series, but it was really the strength of this one, even in its... Simplicity and compared to its uh, it, a lot of its successors, but it's the strength of this one that allowed the series to to grow. Uh, the, the other thing is, and it's part of the reason why I like uh, Casino Royale so much, is that it's much more grounded than some of the later ones would be. Right. And it's truer to its uh, to its source material. I was gonna say because like a lot of people know, especially like our generation, you know, you hear. James Bond, and you think, you know, oh, he's a spy, he's got, you know, 
all the girls too, and I think that more so than that is all the gadgets, whether it be you know a, a secret gun or a watch or you know watch with a laser that you can do out of, out, or you know the car. The car is bigger too. We're here in Doctor No, and I think even like a little bit from, from Russia with Love, like the early James Bond movies. You know, Goldeneye doesn't have uh, not Goldeneye, Goldfinger doesn't have many gadgets, but that's when they start to get more into the gadgets. Um, and Casino Royale, like you said, with the first Daniel Craig one, definitely takes it back a bit. Um, definitely has a different feel. Too. Definitely has a different... Or slightly, not, still, not a, a drastic different feel, but like a slightly different feel that you're like, this guy's just going out there and doing what needs to be done with whatever he's got. You know, like in a Dr. Nom, just re-watching it now, and it's like, what's his trick? He puts a strand of hair over the closet door. You know, where... Today it'd be some sort of high tech, what you call it, <laughs> to catch the guy. So, I definitely enjoy the ones where they, you know, they strip the gadgets back a little bit. And I like that with the three Daniel Craig ones, they continue that. Where they ha he has little things here and there, but nothing like you know, a car that can, you know, go invisible. Yeah, that again, that that's that's part of the thing that I like about it, and uh, I'm. I'm so I'm so glad that you mentioned that, uh, because you see, especially, and it really did start, not quite so much. I mean, you saw a little bit. You saw it in Goldfinger with the car, but he, but Fleming had written some of those things in there. Like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think he had written in like the machine guns or something yeah. like that. So the the car wasn't too out there. No, and like I was saying, even like from what was it from Russia with Love, he has like. Yeah, he has the briefcase, little secret compartments and stuff. Yeah. So, but it was, and there's nothing like I said. There are these little, little gadgets, little trick, which we call it, whatever you want to call it, the briefcase or a car. But it never, you know, it was still not quite even the Roger Moore type gadgets, or you know, let alone the, what they ended up doing with the Pierce Brosnan movies. You know, Goldeneye is not too bad, but with the Tomorrow Never Dies and World Is Not Enough and Die Another Day. Die Another Day probably being the worst of all four. The Pierce Brosnan yeah. ones. You know, uh, the gadgets kind of almost over, or they try to like overshadow the character almost. It's like, yeah, you definitely, you definitely start seeing it. Um, you see bits of it in. Uh, you see, you see a little bit in. You only live twice. They kind, of, they kind of drew it back a little bit in Honor Master's Secret Service. But definitely once you get to the Roger Moore era, the gadgets just kind of yeah. lost control of themselves. And I think they had a watch. I don't want to see the second salt. half of that era, too, though, because, like, you know, I'm thinking now, like, Liver Let Die, you know, he's basically only using that watch. And I don't remember many other, you know, the watch to escape the uh, crocodile pit or alligator pit, whatever they are. Um, I don't remember many other gadgets other than the watch, though. I just remember a lot of parades. Yes. <laughs> Lots of parades, uh, alligators. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, the thing is, uh, he kind of went through most of that one with the watch not doing too much. I mean, he tries to use it to get out of the alligator pit, and it doesn't help him. Uh, but when he's at the very end, I mean, not only does he use it to, to draw the shark pellet, but then, and Q never... You know, you never see anything like this when it's brought to him. All of a sudden, the face turns into a buzzsaw, and it's like, wh when did, where did this come from? That that is a bit much, but 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 again, it, I, I, this is this is always been part of my thing is that you're absolutely right. Uh, the Roger Moore era, uh, not initially with Pierce Brosnan. Um, well, I mean, he had the gadgets like he again he had the watch in Golden Eye. Um, the, that could cut through a train floor. Um, yeah, the the laser. I mean, the the having the remote control on it to connect to yeah. his minds. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. But the laser is a little it's like, really? And okay. Then how can but, you forget the like the pen, the exploding pen? I love that, that thing. Yeah, that, that to me is awesome. Nothing, nothing too uh, too bad. No, tomorrow tomorrow never dies. Um, his big thing was really uh, the car, but having a uh, with the remote control and within the cell phone and everything. It, but the, what you what you realize is a lot of that stuff, um, it's it's actually kind of commonplace 
now. Uh, I mean, having like having touch controls yeah. for things like that. I mean, at the time it's just futuristic, but now it's like everything's got you know touch controls on it now. Right. So there are a couple of things that actually. One thing I love about the Bond series is that there's a lot of this stuff that actually they kind of pioneer some of this stuff. Like right. the pager. The first pager that I've ever seen was in from Russia with love. He gets a he gets a beep, he looks, he goes over to his car and a printout is saying, Oh, you have to return back to headquarters and I was like Is does he have a beeper in nineteen sixty three? What the hell is this? You know, the crazy little things like that, but uh yeah, and I was watching the dog kind of Dr. Nurse now, and uh, he's entering uh, the room where he's going to have dinner with um, with Dr. No. And I was like, did that door just slide? Like, was this, when, when did Star Trek debut? Because I thought Star Trek you know, introduced us to the sliding door concept. Like, that's what I've always heard. And I, I was like, this is, I, maybe it was Bond. Maybe I've been mistaken all these years. Yeah, you, you, have, you, you that, that's actually... That's a very good point. I didn't even think of that. I heard the same anecdote that you did, that you know the government went to them like, "How do you do that?" And they're like, "Oh, well, we just have guys on pulleys." And then they you're right. When did Star Trek start? Did it start after Doctor No? Because if it did, yeah, Bond may have pioneered the concept of like the automatic door. Right. Uh, but so again, Doctor No, want to give us a uh, quick recap of what the uh, story is all about in Doctor No and. Uh, maybe go into some of the little differences between the movie and the book because of how it's the second, or is it the second or third book? Dr. No is, uh, let me see, I want to say the sixth book. Sixth book, oh wow. It goes Casino Royale, Live and Let Die, Moonraker, Diamonds Are Forever, From Russia with Love, and Dr. No, incidentally, that's one of the little bits of trivia that I'm going to mention later. Sure. I, I, I'll get into that. Uh, but it's actually, it, it is the sixth of the original books. So there's actually a large span of stories that come, you know, in between that we don't get to see much of until, you know, later on in the series. So that's interesting, though, like, uh to take the sixth book in the series, which at that point the character is pretty well established as who Bond is, and use that book to be the one to introduce the cinematic world to the character, and also add in that bit of character development, like who exactly is James Bond? Is there big differences between, like, because of that, like between the movie and the book, or is it just little things they had to add in to be like, all right, this is who James Bond is, but this book is, you know, this story is still what the book was saying. Um, no, I, I, I feel like, uh, I mean, it's been some time since I've read Dr. No, but it's definitely, um, he's, al- he, there's a, he's already established at this point, so there's a lot of introductory stuff, um, that gets left out. You know, there's a lot of stuff that it... It's almost like... With bon, with this being this far into his... Into his story arc... It, it's almost like they're not... Like... They're not even going into the, the whole idea of introducing him. He knows who he is. You're just here to pick it up. You know, it... Bond's not going to go through any of this stuff going through all this... Oh, well, uh, this is your first... No. I'm already here. I already know what I'm doing. Just... Come with me. Right. Hmm. So, um, why don't you give us a quick overview of what Dr. No itself is uh, about? Dr. No is the story of uh, Bond stopping the, uh, the exploits of Dr. Julius No, who's, um, at least in the book, he was working on uh, freelance for the Soviet Union to disrupt uh, our efforts to launch rockets to the moon and basically pioneering uh, ICBM and rocket technology. Kind of the early, this is, this is at the early point of the space race, and this kind of, uh, what, I think what a lot of people in today's 
uh, time don't quite grasp is just the importance of what uh, of what we were doing in to Dr. Nose and the importance of why he was trying to stop it. If he can convince us that we can't, you know, get rockets off the ground, if he can keep toppling them and keep screwing up their trajectories, we lose the space race. And again, to us, you know, because we've already because we won the space race, it, it doesn't. It's not something we can necessarily grasp in today's world, but so for say my parents, who grew up right in the height of the Cold War, you know, this this is huge. We lose the space race. Uh, American morale, you know, in fighting the Cold War, gone. And so the Soviet Union kind of hires him out to to try and derail the space race, to kind of, you know, knock us out of the game. And Bond is sent uh, back to Jamaica. There have been, in the earlier books, he had already been to Jamaica at, at least once in uh, Live and Let Die. And Bond is sent back to, Ch back to Jamaica to investigate the death of his friend, Strangways, who was uh, MI6's agent in Jamaica. He's sent to investigate his death. That leads him into... Uh, discovering what Dr. No is doing and putting a stop to him. So you're saying that there's, you know, between the, the book and the movie, there's you know, only like subtle changes to kind of catch people up to on who, who Bond is, but pretty much, you know, is, is it fairly, fairly faithful to the book, or do they change a lot, like in other Bond adaptations? Uh, no, this one was actually pretty close. There are a few, there's a few subtle details, one of which I will mentioned later. Um, but for the most part, uh, it is pretty close. Oh, the... Eh, I, mean, this, I suppose it's still kind of a minor detail. Um, the front for Dr. No's operation in the book, it was uh, a guano plant. Guano is, well, for lack of a better term, bat droppings. <laughs> but it has... Uh, industrial and agricultural purposes. It, that was his front. That's how he kept people away. Like, oh, well, he's just got a guano plant. Yeah, whatever. In in the movie, it's a bauxite mine. But other than other than that, most you know, that's probably the largest difference that I can tell between the two. I was really uh, my, my one of my favorite parts has always been the opening with the whole three blind mice intro, and then those you know the three henchmen acting out as the the three blind guys and to kind of infiltrate and uh, kill the guy at the opening. I always thought that was is that is that the same? So you're saying that's the same as the book? And if I remember correctly, again, it's been some time since I've read Doctor No, but uh, the largest differences are, I, I pretty well remember. So I'm I'm fairly certain that that was pretty close to what happened. Uh, again. It's been a while, but I'm pretty sure that, that was that, that was how it went. I really just like, watching it this time. I was really enjoying because I've only seen Doctor No a couple times, and it's always been like years in between. So it's almost like that, as I said with other films, like it's always one of that fresh watching of it. Like, it's not like you don't remember everything. Um, so I was really enjoying it at the beginning when you know so you've been introduced to Bond, and you know he starts being followed by people. And he gets off the air, out of the airport, and like you know, he gets in the car, and there's that, you know, a little bit of a, ch a little bit of a chase scene, and then eventually you learn out that the guy who was following him was Felix Leiter, who's an American spy, and they kind of team up, and I'm like, oh, it's just so fun that like, you're not being able to trust anybody that you're introduced to in the Bond verse. Yes, I mean it, it, it definitely, and of course because this is a world of espionage. It, to a certain degree, it's expected. And that, that's kind of what you want, is to be like, okay, can I trust this guy? Can I not trust this guy? But that that is a fairly large difference between the book and the movie, because if I remember correctly, I'm not sure if Felix is... I'm, I think he's in it, but I know that you're certainly introduced to him in Casino Royale. So Bond already knows him uh, by Dr. No. Right. What's more, um, Felix, there's a, 
you know, Felix's condition is much different than what you would have seen him in the book. Uh, in the book, if, I, if if he was in it, uh, by by the doctor, no, Felix has been uh, has been kind of maimed. He was maimed in Live and Let Die by Mr. Big. In fact, uh, you saw License to Kill, correct? Yep. The scene where uh, where he is fed to the shark and there's the note on that says he you know he disagree with something that ate him, that is ripped straight from Live and Let Die. Hmm. And it's Mr. Big who does that to him. Hmm. So Felix is in much better shape than he would have been in the book. Right. That's interesting. Um, do you have a favorite moment from the movie? For me, it's... Uh, I, I suppose I have, I have two. Um, his introduction. I mean, it, and this is, I suppose, part of... Uh, I, I feel like it kind of goes into the fact that, that this was so far along in his storyline. Um, pretty much the... Like, the only real introduction we get to him is him introducing himself. That's it. You don't really get any backstory to him. It's just, you know, Bond. James Bond. And uh, to me, it's, there's a lot of power in, in that introduction. Like, literally every other Bond has been measured by how they do that line. That first time they, they take on the role is how they introduce themselves. That's how iconic... Connery's uh, introduction of himself is that that's become the measuring stick. Yeah, and I mean, I believe it's one of uh, the top 100 uh, movie lines of all time. So, and, and it's and it's so, it's so simple. It's just a guy introducing himself, but right. it's just so powerful. Uh, you know, iconography, like a, like how how often do we see people kind of imitate this where they say their last name first, it, where it was kind of you know. A thing to do back at you know back at the time. These days, when people do it, nine times out of ten, they're mimicking Sean Connery as James Bond. Uh, attempting to. <laughs> uh, the other is when he first meets Doctor No. Right. Like that kind of. I mean, this is your, this is not just his introduction to Doctor No, but it is your introduction to Doctor No. Yeah, and I think that was, like, again, watching it just now, I was really enjoying how, like, they kept the bad guy a mystery until, like, the last 30 minutes of the movie. Like, yes. you're introduced to the name Dr. No, but you have no idea what he looks like, which is, like, you watch Goldfinger, and, like, five minutes in, you're like, all right, I know he's the bad guy, and you're just waiting for Bond to get him. Yes. You know? Where here, it's like, you have just the, the secrets kept for pretty long throughout, and even when you technically first see Dr. No in, uh, what was it? Bond has, like, that coffee which knocks him out. Yep. And then you just see the feet go into his room, and you see the hand, which reminds me of the penguin every time. <laughs> Can't help it. We see the hand, and that's it. You're still like, so that's Dr. No, but I don't know what he looks like. <laughs> what? I want to see his face. And then you hear, a million dollars. One million dollars, Mr. Bond. You're wondering what it costs. And... And that voice, like, he, he sets the tone for every other Bond villain to follow. Definitely. And that's another thing that gets imitated so often, is you have this, this villain with that kind of, uh, you know, extra sophisticated voice, but you know that he's the bad guy. You know, he, he, he sets the tone for supervillains for, like, the next 50 years. That's true. It just always cracks me up, though, because it's like, think about it. He, you know, he walks in and sees Bond sleeping. All he has to do is just, boom, he's done. Just shoot him and carry on with the rest of his plan. And it's like almost like I'm just watching this. I'm like, this is what Mike Myers was making fun of with Austin Powers and Dr. Evil. <laughs> was that it? it's like he has so many opportunities to just get this guy out of his way, but he always kind of gives him that second chance. Well, Dr. No does explain himself. He he thinks that Bond might have a, you know that he's that he's been such a, a thorn in his side that he could be a worthwhile member of Spectre. Yeah, and I I noticed that line this morning too. I was like, oh, so he's trying to convert him too, but it's still kind of like, but you know he's gonna be a good guy in the end. Like I don't think he could turn this guy. Well, yeah, but 
the audience knows this, but Dr. No doesn't know this. It's true, but still, it's like, ah, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just from, you know, watching the newer movies and everything that's changed since 62 to now in storytelling. That is just like, come just, on. Just, just do it already. Just hit him. But then it kills the story. Like, I don't know. Um, this is dovetailing off track a little bit. But it's like that recent episode of Big Brain Theory when they burst the bubble that in Raiders of the Lost Ark, if Indiana Jones wasn't there, the exact same thing would have happened. Like, so we, Indiana Jones plays no part in the events of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That is true. And just like bubble bursted. So. I see that actually, there is one of that, that scene with Dr. No. That is one of the differences between the book and the movie. In the book, Dr. No literally had, like, claw hands. He literally had, like, uh, prosthetic claws instead of, like, the crazy, you know, metallic Frankenstein hands that he has in the movie. But I think they did that because his death in the books was different than what it is here. Here, because he's, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the book, Bond dropped like a ton of guano on him and crushed him. Because they kind of threw the whole bat turd front out of, uh, you know, out of the story, they needed to change, they needed to find a new way for him to die. And so they had to change up his hands in order to make that plausible. Right. They're still kind of messed up hands, though, like... Oh, definitely. He can't shake the hand, but he can hold a cigarette. That was well, kinda... he maybe he doesn't want to. It's impolite to crush somebody's hand. Right, that's true. <laughs> he it's can crush cool. the golden Buddhas all he likes, but he knows, like, man, it's just rude for me to crush someone's hand. That is a good point. And he's clearly something of a gentleman. Otherwise, he would have just killed Bond right then and there. Yeah. So uh... he knows. He know. He he he. he Respects politeness. So, next film was from Russia with Love, and did that kind of carry on for you? Like, is it to live up to Dr. No for you, or. Like, how does it go from, like, Dr. No to the rest of the series? Because you're, you're saying, like, Dr. No, I mean, obviously it's the first in the series, kind of sets the tone, but, like, how does, at least the Connery years, and we'll glaze over. Never say never again for the Connery years right now. But, like, his initial stint is Bond. <laughs> his first five, then his six, which yeah. is there's a gap in between, and then goes on. How do those first, like, com- how the rest of the movies with Connery compare to Dr. No for you? Like, Well, I mean, my, my all-time favorite, like, all-time... And I think this goes for almost everybody is Goldfinger. Uh, but knowing that they hadn't quite gotten to this, to uh, to that level yet, uh, you know, when one compares uh, From Russia with Love to Doctor No, it it does what you'd expect a sequel to do. It it amps things up because you now actually have a legitimate gadget. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in his suitcase, um, like the espionage, the kind of thing that he's dealing with, that is amped up. Um, you're get, you're seeing more of Spectre. You're adding, uh, a, you know, an additional villain. Uh, and I have to say that oh, why am I oh. Uh, Robert Robert Shaw playing Red Grant is even he's he's that much more sinister than Joseph Wiseman was as Doctor No. Right. I mean, so every everything is dialed up a little bit more. I mean, it's not quite to the craziness that you see after Thunderball per se, but it definitely tries to go above and beyond its predecessor. But at the same time, it's still grounded. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, it, the the whole reason why uh, Bond is popular to any degree at all is because this story was uh, was listed on like one of the top ten books 
favored by President Kennedy. Wow. President Kennedy loved this book. That's where, where all the popularity came from. And he loved it because at this time, like, this really was like a Tom Clancy novel in its day. Right. There was no over-the-top gadgets. It was about, the book was about, uh, you know, Smirsh, the uh, assassination arm of the KGB, basically saying, okay, we have, this Bond guy has been screwing with our plans for years now. We need, to, we need to get rid of him. But the only way we can get rid of him is to discredit him and make, uh, and to make MI6 look bad to the West. So they go through this big elaborate scheme of trying to bring him down, and they, they get, you know, they dip into their pool of assassins, and they find the one guy who's a defector from Britain. You know, they find Red Grant, and he's, he's like this sociopath. I'm like, okay, that's our guy. We're going to send him in to, to do this job, to, you know, to discredit Bond, to humiliate him. Then we're going to kill him. And mm, job done. Uh, you know, it was it, it didn't have the crazy like world domination schemes that you would see in the later ones. Right. And that's and that's really what I liked about it. But this is the first of the little trivia tidbits that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the end of From Russia with Love, you you've seen it. Yep. Where he's sitting there fighting off Rosa Klebb and she's trying to stab him with the poison tipped shoe. Mm -hmm. That is the incident where his gun jammed up that M mentions in Dr. No. Okay. That's why they give him the Walther. It's funny that, that essentially the incident that gives the forces MI6 to, to force the Walther on him is uh, an incident that takes place in the following movie. Hmm. That is an interesting tidbit. That is also the first uh, appearance you see of Q where you actually hear his real name. Right. Now, before we get into other your other trivia tidbits, we would almost be remiss if we were to skip the Bond girl of Dr. No, Ursula Andress as Honey Rider. Yep. The iconic bathing suit. When you first introduced her on the beach. Is she up there one of your favorite Bond girls? Or... Uh... I suppose for me, and this goes with the fact that, you know, Goldfinger is my favorite. My favorite has to be Pussy Galore. I mean, <laughs> hey, come on. Right. I mean, you, you, you know, and the thing is, Denise Richards. <laughs> well, pe people hate on her, but they, you know, like they 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 act like she's like like wicked dumb and stuff, and it's like, well, like, I remember people would complain. Like, oh, well, she says, oh, if I, we don't get this, if we don't recover this plutonium, someone's going to have my ass. Who's going to have your ass? Um, maybe the Kazakhstani government who helped, uh, who hired her to try and get rid of their excess nuclear weapons? Right. I don't know, maybe. I think it's just, you know, because she's Denise Richards and people don't look at her as the character. They look at her as Denise Richards, so. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Uh, but it, I, I always felt like some of those complaints were just kind of, kind of silly on their face. It's like, if you step back for a minute and be like, oh, while well, she was working with the Kazakhstani government, they might be a little upset if they're like, uh, what happened to all the plutonium that you let get stolen from our mine? Uh, we're going to be getting that back anytime soon? You know? It'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Honey Rider, like, so, I mean... I'd say, she, for me, she's got to be, I'd say probably in the top five. Yeah. And, uh... Is the character close to how it was in the book, or did it get anything wrong? No, actually, she was uh, she was pretty accurate. Um, the the little little backstory you get into her about her uh, being raped by her landlord, um, and, and you know they because you did you don't see much of her, you know, until like the second half of the movie, and they don't really have time for any exposition. That little bit that you get, it's, you know, it, it stays true to her. You know, it's not like uh, some of the other ones who are just, uh, oh, what's her name from that 70s show? Who was in, uh, from A View to a Kill. She played Donna's mother. Yeah, I, f I can't think of her name. Yeah, like, she's, 
she's like the complete antithesis of that, where you get all this stuff about her, but she's a terrible character. Honey right. Ryder, on the other hand, she's the complete opposite. She's, you know, she, despite what a lot of people might claim, you know, she's not, she's not, a, she's not a dunce. She's not um, a bimbo. You know, she's she's defiant. She's feisty. She's if she can defend herself if she needs to. You know, really, just an all-around great character. Definitely one of my favorites. Now, I've just so happened to have saved an old conversation you and I had about our favorite Bond movies. And I want to see if this has changed at all. This is probably going back to, I'm trying to see here, November of 2012. Okay. That's when this is going back. And you'd given your top six. Okay, you're giving your top six favorite Bond films, and let's see if this still holds up for you. Number six was Skyfall. Uh, number five was Diamonds Are Forever, which you also put a little note saying this one is a sentimental favorite. Want to explain that? Uh, when I was first starting to get into the series, uh, this was probably, I want to say, November. Uh, yeah, it had to be November of 96. Because I had just, I had bought an, uh, an N64, I think maybe right around that time, or maybe like a month afterwards. I had gotten, I had started to really get good at playing GoldenEye uh, with some of my friends. And I wanted to get more into the, the character. I realized there's this whole other universe that he was part of. And so I started trying to watch the Bond movies, and I watched uh, part of Goldfinger, but I didn't see all of it like from the beginning. But right around that time, it was Thanksgiving, and TBS was having a Bondathon, like from Thanksgiving all the way until like the next Monday. And they were showing all of the Bond movies, like, up to that point, with the exception of GoldenEye. And I remember Diamonds Are Forever was one of the first ones that I caught almost in its entirety. And I remember watching this, like, this movie is awesome! Like, I, I, I didn't know how the, how, how the order went, so I thought this was the one that immediately followed Goldfinger, and I'm, my mind was blown watching this movie. Uh, it, just everything about it was just... It was just amazing to me. Uh, you know, this was this is the first time we have like the giant laser right. uh, orbiting around the Earth, which at, you know these days has become cliche. But at the time, it's like holy shit. Yeah. So I'm sitting there watching this, and it's just everything about it I enjoyed. Like literally everything about it. This is a chase scene in Las Vegas. Uh, he's driving around in a moon rover. Uh, there's a fake moon landing set with guys in astronaut costumes in slow motion trying to hit him with pickaxes and missing horribly. It, just nothing about that that I didn't enjoy. That's why it's on there. Fair enough. Um, so that was number five. Number four is For Your Eyes Only, which is a great one. It is. Uh, number three is Golden Eye, which needs no explanation as why that's in your top three. Definitely not. Number two is Goldfinger. Mm-hmm. And number one is Casino Royale. I absolutely love that movie. So you're not going to revise this? Nothing's being shifted around? It's going to stay? Uh, no, I'm, I'm fairly confident with, with what we have. But, I mean... What is it about Casino Royale that beats out Goldfinger, though? Like, like... Well, the, the thing about, about Casino Royale is... I mean, number one, it, it it is more now. Granted, granted, Goldfinger is not one of those over-the-top ones like Moonraker per se. See, uh, I've heard so many people say Moonraker is so over the top and so bad that when I finally watched it the other year, I was like, "This isn't that bad. Like, it's an enjoyable movie. Yeah, it's it, not. It is. It's not up to par with Goldfinger and you know Casino Royale, but it's not. It was like 
people made it seem like an Ed Wood movie, like the, <laughs> the Plan 9 from Outer Space of the Bondverse. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that it's like when I finally sat down and watched it, I'm like, it's not that bad. I see where a lot of the jokes from Austin Powers of Spy You Shag Me came from, but it's not that bad. No, it's not it's not terrible. But um when you go from The Spy Who Loved Me, which was much more grounded that to a certain a degree. One. Yes. Uh and For Your Eyes Only, which was very grounded. It Moonraker just it just kind of stands out as being really kind of over the top because he's He's going into space and he's having laser battles with the people. It's, it's, it's definitely campy, but I mean. And there's definitely a lot of silliness when he's in Italy. Um, but I understand it, but it's just like. No, uh, when I first got it, I I, I love that movie to death. But that was before I read the book, and you know I'm I'm I criticize it from the perspective of someone who's read the book mm-hmm. and 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 looked at it like man, like. The the story the story in the book, I thought was so much was so much better than how it was presented in the movie. They could the movie could have been awesome. I feel like if they'd taken out some of the campiness and delved a little bit more into Drax having this god complex, right? I mean, Moonraker could have been amazing, but just the way they uh, the way they did it, it just made it too silly. Right. I feel like for what it should have been. And you've also said that you sometimes, you've also said that you know, die another day was them kind of trying to do Moonraker right. Yeah. But a lot of people would say that die another day is the Moonraker of the Pierce Brosnan era. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the storyline is very much like there's so many elements of the storyline of die another day that are straight out of Moonraker. But that's another one where uh, they. I feel like, especially with the gadgets and some of the Madonna CG. fencing. Hmm? Madonna fencing. <laughs> I don't know what people's feelings were about that. I liked the fencing scene because I feel like that's the that's the sort of thing that uh, that Bond would do. I would say that Madonna was there of... fencing. I mean, just like you know, just the fact that it's Madonna's in a Bond movie that was just random. Well, I mean, she did uh, do the theme song. She did the theme song, but still. <laughs> it's Madonna. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's definitely... There's definitely some of those ones where it's like, okay. But, but, but the thing is, Madonna still good enough at the time that she could pull off being yeah. uh, a minor character. Yeah, and she's a decent movie. actress. Like, if you ever watch her in, like, A League of Their Own, stands out for me. Like, she's great in A League of Their Own. Yes. So it's just, you know, she's one of those people that, like, you know, she's Madonna. She's going to, you know, you're always going to... It's tough to view her outside of what she does on stage and everything. Yeah, it's it's tough to separate Madonna the person from Madonna the persona. Yeah, right. But I mean, that, that didn't bother me so much, but I know... Uh, a lot of people, even though the technology is technically in development, uh, I think it was a little too ahead of the curve. The the invisible car, um, and I think a lot of people were just like, just kind of point and laugh at the yeah. windsurfing, yeah, and you watch the wind, thing that he's you doing. Watch the windsurfing thing, and it's, it's just horrible graphics, just horrible, horrible graphics. Like you should have. Oh yeah. For a Bond franchise, they should have had more money gone into that, especially because that's, what, 2002? Yep. So you've got the Matrix. You're in the middle of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The CG technology was there to do a better wave than what was depicted in <laughs> Dying of the Day. But, but back to Casino Royale, um, why that one is uh, currently topping your favorite Bond movies. My thing with Casino Royale is this was the story that for a long time they couldn't do. Uh, in fact, Kevin McClory, the guy who directed Thunderball and Never Say Never Again, attempted to have claim to it because, if I'm not mistaken, originally 
the store was produced for TV uh, in 53, I think, on, uh, on NBC. So I think Universal had some uh, rights to the, to the story. But uh, MGM, UA, they were able to kind of beat him back one last time because he was always trying to lay claim to the series or try and, you know, make his own uh, rogue Bond movies. That's why we have Never Say Never Again. Uh, but they finally beat him back and, and took the rights to it. So this was always the story, the original Fleming story that they never got to do. And when they finally got the rights to it, uh, this gave them the opportunity to, to go back to the beginning to really, uh, truly introduce us to Bond. And I like that, uh, that they really, really grounded this one. Right. Uh, I also liked the, the, the love story between him and Vesper Lind. Definitely. Uh, that is probably one of the strongest love stories in any of the Bond stories. And unlike when they did Iron Mash's Secret Service, where a lot, a lot of people kind of didn't like uh, Bond showing that emotion at the end, here, it, I think they did it in a much better fashion. Where you, you see Bond, I mean, he's not like breaking down, but he's in there struggling to try and revive Vesper, you know, to no avail. But you see, you 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 see his reaction. You know, he 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 doesn't he doesn't you know break down. He's like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Mr. White, mm-hmm. and it, it, I feel like it's the best way. I feel like that's the best way of reintroducing the character. I, some of my favorite uh, Bond movies are always the ones where there, where there's been an absence and they're kind of reintroducing him again. Because I feel like those ones are always the strongest. Goldeneye, the same thing, exactly. the same director, I think. It is the same director, yep. Uh, and those ones are always some of the strongest ones. And because of not just because of that, but when you take that, you combine the love story and you combine the fact that Bond is at his most grounded. Uh, and I, this is one of the reasons why I like Dr. No. He, he he gets the crap kicked out of him, but he just keeps on going. Right. You know, he's he's beaten, he's bruised, he's bloody, uh, but he, he's just like, okay, what else you got? You know, I, I can keep going. I, I will keep going. Until I get you, I'm not stopping. He did, and that's what I like about it. That's the one where... He had the defibrillator in the car, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's about the... That and having the, the gun in the glove box were about the only gadgets in that. I don't even think... Did the, did the cell phone have, like, a th- thumbprint tracker or something? Yeah. That was uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah. There's something with, I think, the cell phone, too, because, there's you know, they did a clear, like, Sony Ericsson product placement plug with the cell phone. I think he had like a GPS tracker or something like that, yeah. but that's not too out of place. No, it's not. In today's cell phones. No, totally. Just trying to think. Like he did have a couple gadgets, but nothing. And even still, like, even in Quantum of Solace and uh, in Skyfall, he hasn't had anything ridiculous as far as gadgets are concerned. I mean, Skyfall were finally introduced to Q branch again, and they even make fun of the crazy gadgets from. Previous Bond movies. The exploding pen. <laughs> yep. I love. We're, we're not. We're not into that these days. No. Definitely. Um, and speaking of Skyfall, because you and I have had this conversation many times, I want to hear. Um, I don't know if you've seen the story, but the writer, uh, John Logan, intends for Bond twenty four and twenty five to do and kind of build on what they had done in Skyfall and keep movies in that kind of tone and go in that direction with the character. My question for you is, do you think they will return to wrap up the story with Mr. White? I hope so. <laughs> because, I mean, to anyone who's seen uh, Quantum of Solace, you see that miserable bastard Mr. White get away 
And then when Bond is kind of snooping on that little meeting at uh, you know at the opera in Brigands, Bond kind of calls out everyone else and starts taking pictures of them, and everyone starts like leaving. So that's how mm -hmm. he's able to take pictures of all of them. Mr. White just you know, takes the headpiece out, sticks it in his pocket, and just sits back down. As far as he's like, hey, Bond doesn't know I'm here. I'm not gonna sit there and alert him. <laughs> yeah. So, some people just don't like the opera. <laughs> you know, and you know, he, he sit there and just like, he got away. No one gets away. Right. Ah, I, I'm hoping because he's a loose end that I really would enjoy seeing them finish up and want to kind of finally get his revenge on Mr. White. Right. It could even be like one of the, like, it could even just be like the opening sequence to the movie, and, like, that's, you know, he's chasing him down, catches him, main titles, go on with the rest of the movie. Like, that's all you have to do, you know? Yeah, like they did in uh, For Your Eyes Only with Blofeld. Right. Or I was thinking of uh, Dark Knight when he catches Scarecrow. Yeah, kind of, similar idea. Yeah. Um, I just want him to wrap it up somehow, Mr. White, because it's like, he's, especially because, you know, you know, it's still going to be Daniel Craig. Yep. And they could bring it back, you know. They've kind of gotten, but I just don't know where they'd go exactly. And I mean, that's it's gonna be fun. I definitely want them to keep. The Skyfall was amazing. I thought it was definitely one of my favorites. Like you know, your number six at the moment. Um, I just, I just hope they. I just want to know what happens to Mr. White. I can't stand the idea of him getting away and never seeing Bond. Get him finally. It, I, I would spend I spend the rest of my life being like, oh, they need to get Mr. White. Definitely, definitely. Um, is there any book? I know there's a, there's a couple new Bond books, so you've brought them up at movie nights before. And is there, is, is there any books out there that they haven't done, or any short stories? Like I know Quantum of Solace started out as a short story that they stretched into a movie. Um, any of those stories you'd like them to see? tackle in the cinematic universe? There was one uh, that came out around 2000. Uh, one of my personal favorites was called Double Shot. It was about this... Uh, he had two martinis shaken upstairs instead of just one? <laughs> no. Um... It was about this uh, this terrorist in Spain who was essentially trying to, uh, in an attempt to reclaim Gibraltar for Spain, essentially try and start a war between Britain and Spain. You know, kind of uh, forced relations to get so bad over the issue of Gibraltar that they eventually, you know, came to blows. And um, and part of the reason why it's called Double Shot is the terrorist organization that uh, he's in collusion with, they hire a guy to go through plastic surgery, some Welsh guy, uh, to go through plastic surgery to look like Bond. To go in there and to uh, make Bond look like he's gone rogue. To go in there killing people and help stir the pot and... Uh, cause the, the tensions between Spain and Britain to escalate. And there's just... I, I, rem when I, I remember reading the book. Uh, I, I read it during the finals week uh, when I was a sophomore, I believe, in high school. Instead of studying for your finals, you're reading James Bond. That's responsible. I, I, I figured if I, if I already... It, you know, if I've gotten this far, I already know what I'm going to need to know. I'm like, trying to cram it in. I'm just going to forget stuff. Like I, I know what I know. Besides, the besides, there were a few finals that I was uh, graded out of. I think I had like a, an English final or a math final that year that my teacher was like, yeah, your average is already at this, so you don't need to do the final. You're all set. So, I, I, so everyone else is sitting there doing the test, and I'm just like... <clears throat> I'm going to read. <laughs> Besides, it was a 40-minute bus ride from Braintree uh, going halfway around the damn town 
into Canton. So I had 40 minutes, you know, in the morning and then in the afternoon to read. That's how, I, you know, I get my reading in that way. Squeeze it in when you can. True story. Uh, and that one, I, there was just so much intrigue in it. I remember reading that book. I couldn't put that book down. Because Bond, uh, at the same time Bond was recuperating from injuries he had sustained in the previous part of this uh, trilogy of books, where he was up in the Himalayas, he's recuperating from injuries he sustained there. So he was on this, uh, he was on this medication that caused him to black out. So Bond himself doesn't even know, uh, he, because he can't remember, he doesn't know, like, did I actually do this stuff? What's going on here? And so you don't know what's going on, Bond doesn't know what's going on, until finally he's confronted by his doppelganger, you know, in like this uh, abandoned bullfighting ring somewhere in Spain, and, you know, finally, you know, has it out with him. But hmm. just the, that whole book was just amazing. Yeah, that sounds like it would make a really fun movie, and again, again kind of like a different Bond story than we've seen on the screen before. But I, I wonder with the success of Skyfall, and that was that's a hundred percent original, not drawing from any Bond source before it, right? Not that I am aware of. I wonder if they're going to try and keep going in that direction with it, just because of how successful Skyfall was. But well, I, I think part of what they're saying is, um, I mean, what we saw in this one is essentially. I mean, this this whole pretty much the whole Daniel Craig uh, era has been them reintroducing us to Bond, building him back up to Bond as we know him. Yes. Because throughout all of Casino Royale, uh, not until the very last, very last frame does he actually do the introduction. The rest <laughs> of that whole movie, he doesn't he doesn't introduce himself. You know, it isn't until the end. He shoots Mr. White, Mr. White's crawling around, and he looks up, and that's when Bond, you know, does the introduction. Right, and plus the opening of the movies when he does his two kills, and then the intro I is love that. becoming a 007. Or Best a 007. opening ever. Yeah. Awesome opening. So you, you are, I agree totally that, like, especially in, obviously in Casino Royale, and then it's carried over into Quantum. I feel like Skyfall, he was a little bit more sure of himself, you know, well, especially at the closing of Quantum, where he's like, "She's dead. I'm just gonna go keep doing what I'm gonna do." Like he'd kind of finally gotten over Vesper, at least on the outside. <laughs> um, that Skyfall, I felt like they're still making at them. He's not, you know, quite the suave Bond that we saw in Doctor No with Connery and you know, subsequent Bond movies. But he's still a little more sure of himself in Skyfall than he is. In Casino Royale and Quantum. Yes, uh, and this was this was my point was that um, in this one, this is kind of the the end of that part of the arc uh, because M is we we have a male M. They're in what uh, to someone like me who's gone through all these stories is the old building, but in this at this point in the storyline, essentially the new building, mm -hmm. uh, but essentially the old MI6 office. He's got all the nautical stuff. Money Penny is there at the desk. Uh, the the double padded doors. The whole nautical theme in M's office. He is essentially back to where we started. Right. With what what you know, people like you and I know as the old M is now in charge. Uh, Money Penny is there. It it is now essentially. I feel like the end of that is kind of them saying. This is now Bond as we remember him. He has now finally gotten back to this point. All right. Uh, I'm definitely interested to see where they take it. Like I said, I mean, I've never read a Bond book or a short story like you have, so I have no idea which source material they would they would draw from. So to me, it'll be as fresh as an original story anyway. But I mean, it is something kind of fun too, just knowing that like this is drawn from the Bond canon that exists somewhere on paper. Yes, uh, and especially for me, having read nearly all of them, uh, I know that there is literally like another 20 books that have been written by subsequent authors uh, when the publishers 
who the publishers and Ian Fleming's family went to to, to say, okay, we are, we are entrusting the series to you to pick it back up. I, this, I, I think there's almost another 20 books in that span that uh, you tweak a little thing here or there yeah. and you can essentially throw this into the modern era and still have it work as a Bond story. Right. You just, you know, change the war to the war, you know, the modern war on terror, and there you go. Like, or, you, or you can add in, uh, you know, sketchy people from, uh, from other countries that we're still not entirely cool with. Uh, right. You know, in, in fact, um, one story I was thinking of was the first post-Ian Fleming story. It was called Colonel Sun. Uh, and they kind of reference him in uh, the villain in Dying of the Day. He was called Colonel Moon, but it was essentially the same thing. And that's what you can do. You can have him be this North Korean uh, military guy because we're still... Our relations with North Korea have actually seemed to have gotten worse, you know, in the last few years. Right. So you can sit there and have him be this sketchy North Korean uh, military guy or government guy, you know, trying to essentially reignite the Cold War or something to... Uh, get China back into their good graces or something like that. You know, it, any you, you can do all, all sorts of things that don't need to be over-the-top world domination stuff, but stuff that uh, anyone in the audience would be like, man, this if this happened, this would be really, really bad. Right. And I think that's what made Skyfall so fun is because um, Silva wasn't necessarily trying to conquer anything other than getting revenge on MI6 and M. Yeah. He wasn't trying to, you know, steal tons of money. He wasn't trying to blow up the moon. He wasn't doing anything ridiculous like that. He was just, it was a pure revenge flick, which made it a lot of fun. It was like, well, yeah, the two of them chasing each other back and forth. And that's, I think, what made Skyfall fun was it, was, like you're saying, it wasn't this grand scheme. It was just, I'm a bad guy. You're the good guy. Let's butt heads. Yeah, and that's part of what I've liked about all of the uh, Daniel Craig ones. As I said before, they've kept them grounded. I mean, if you look at all the original uh, Fleming books, almost n it wasn't until Thunderball that you get to this whole kind of world domination sort of thing. And even then, Thunderball in and of itself is still, uh, its premise today is still very grounded. It's the idea of a, a terrorist organization getting a nuke and saying, well, we're going to hold the world hostage. Uh, but all of them, it was always, um, it was always these little plots. Uh, you know, Le Chiff was, uh, he had gambled off the money that he'd gotten from Smirsh, and he needed to win it back. They sent Bond there to make him lose, so that his employers would kill him and wouldn't make him into a martyr to uh, communists in France. It's, it's, that's that's how these that's how they all worked. It was always you know trying to get funds to uh, you know trying to get money to fund other espionage operations by the Soviet Union you know in the West. Uh, it was trying to disrupt our attempts to win the space race. Uh, From Russia with Love was just a revenge story, pretty much. It was you know Smirsh wanting to kill Bond. You know, even Goldfinger, uh, Goldfinger was one of the few where it was, a, it was actually more, I think a little bit more grounded in the movie than it was in the book. But and up until that point, they had all been very, very yeah. down to earth, none of this world domination stuff. Right. We'll see where it goes. Um, and to wrap things up, I have one more question for you. It's the ultimate Bond Cinema Universe question. We all can probably assume your favorite actor is Sean Connery. You would assume correctly. Where do the other actors rank after Sean Connery? Hmm. I will kind of go against tradition, and I will go with uh, Daniel Craig as my number two. Pierce he's Brosnan definitely winning has, a lot of hearts. He's definitely winning people over. I know when they announced him as Bond before Casino Royale, like, what? A blonde Bond? How can it be? I think after Casino Royale and 
I think definitely after Skyfall, because people seem to be split on Quantum. Um, I think Daniel Craig is definitely winning people over as Bond. Well, it's like uh, it's. I think it was Roger Moore on that documentary that I mentioned on the BBC. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Roger Moore who had said, well, you know, Sean Connery didn't, uh, his popularity as the character didn't pick up until uh, until really the third movie. You know, Timothy Dalton only got a chance to do two. You know, we don't know what it would have been like had he gotten to do his third. It always seems to be right. the third time around is usually when uh, the fans really kind of get on board. I feel yeah. like Chris Brosnan, he was kind of good right out of the gate. But... Uh, but it's definitely, you know, the third one is usually when people are like, you know what, this guy, he can be Bond. He's got it. <laughs> uh, but Sean Connery, number one. Daniel Craig, number two. Number three is Pierce Brosnan. Uh, I mean, if for no other reason, just from Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies by themselves, yeah, done. He, he's knocked it out of the park. Um, my number four, I'm going to... This is another one I kind of got to go against tradition a little bit and go with uh, Timothy Dalton. Because Timothy Dalton was, uh, when they picked him to be Bond, and this is another little tidbit, uh, originally, when Sean Connery was hanging it up, they had originally, you know, kind of thought of casting Timothy Dalton for the role back then. This is back in 69, uh, 73, you know, that period. But he, but he himself thought he was too young to play Bond at the time. Hmm. I mean, the whole you, what you realize is there's a whole history of actors who were originally picked to be Bond far earlier in the series history, who didn't end up actually playing the role until much later. It wasn't uh, the original choice, Roger Moore, and he couldn't do it because of some other commitment, and it ended up going to Sean Connery. Bingo. And then the Bingo. same thing happened with the Timothy Dalton movies that they wanted. Brosnan, but because of Remington Steel, they went with Timothy Dalton. Exactly. Or originally, Ian Fleming wanted because uh, when he when he, when they basically said that they wanted to do a series, Cary Grant and David Niven, who were Ian Fleming's original choices, they're like, no, we can't do a series. So his his first pick after that was Roger Moore, but Roger Moore couldn't do it because he was doing The Saint at the time. So he ended up going with Sean Connery. Uh, you know, Sean Connery goes through his thing, and then when he bows out, uh, you know, they first, like, one of their first picks was Timothy Dalton, but he's like, no, I'm too young to play Bond right now. Hmm. So that's how they ended up with George Lazenby. Then uh, Sean Connery comes back, he leaves again, then they get Roger Moore. Roger Moore is doing it from 73 until 1985, and right around the time they did For Your Eyes Only, Chris Brosnan's wife was one of the peripheral Bond girls in that one, and that's when they first got introduced to him. And they were and they were saying back then, like, oh, you know, that guy, he could be the next Bond. And in fact, Roger Moore, uh, as his time was coming to a close, he basically said, hey, if my opinion means anything in who you cast, the guy who should succeed me should be Pierce Brosnan. But then, in fact, I just I just watched this on that documentary. Uh, Barrington Steel had, you know, finished up, um, and NBC had like a 60-day uh, window yeah. to renew it. Yeah, to renew the series. And at that point, you know, they're going through. You know, they basically said to Pierce, like, okay, you know, you pretty much have the role. And Pierce was just waiting it out. He's sitting there waiting, like counting down the days, like 58, 59, literally on the last day, not even the 59th day, the last day. They Literally at the last yeah. hour, they're ready to pop open the champagne and say that he's Bond. NBC, in what to me is, while a re kind of a sound business move, in human terms, it's really douchey. Yeah, it was a dick move. the last minute, and they're like, oh, yeah, we're picking it up again. And it's like, thanks, you couldn't have told me earlier? No, we need to build up more anticipation for Remington Steel. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so then he finally gets it. Uh, you know, they actually they go to Timothy Dalton at that point. He goes, he has his two, and then they go back and finally, after six years on top of the additional uh, two or four years 
before that, like after like 10 years or so, they finally get Pierce Brosnan. And then, you know, he goes, he goes through his term. And at least this time around, I don't think there's anyone who they were like... There didn't seem to be any drama other than them making a thing about Daniel Craig being blonde. Well, because Bond is always written as having black hair. But it, 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 this is, the, you know, 2004, it was 2003 or 2004 that they made the announcement. Hair dye. <laughs> it's that simple. If, if they decide to do that. And it's not like he's, you know, beach blonde. He's kind of got that dirty blonde thing and whatever. It's like, to pick on something, it's almost like they were looking for something to make negative about them casting Daniel Craig, and that was the only thing they could grab at. Was his yeah, there, there, there's, there's always there's always naysayers. Yeah. Uh, the the only other person who uh, the the only other person who I, who I thought that they were kind of like this could be the guy who didn't end up getting it was Clive Owen. Yeah, I've heard him tossed around. I remember that they they talked about uh, Clive Owen being Bond, and I feel like he could do it. Uh, but I feel know, like he almost has like a, not that not to make this sound too too weird or anything, but his face is almost too harsh for Bond. Like, I think he'd be, make a better villain than for Bond himself. Yeah. Well, I, like, it, it's, it, I like, you know, I like that, you know, Sean Connery, Daniel Craig, they definitely have that kind of, like, rugged guy look. Yeah. yeah. You know, not a pretty boy. I'm not saying that, like, Roger Moore and Pierce Brosnan are pretty boys, but, like, you know, they also don't have, they don't have that, like, little bit of edge to, you know, well, is it what I'm oh, yeah. looking for? And, that, and, and, and like, Five Owen is almost like a little bit too much of that, you know. Yeah. He, he 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 might be a little too rough. Like a little yeah, too rough around the edges for it. Like if you like look at the Five Owen movie, like shoot him up. <laughs> he can be that good guy, but can he really pull off Bond? You know that one. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, uh, what's uh, the the international? Yeah. Uh, I feel like he's kind of. I feel like he he kind of straddles that line a little bit there. Channeling Bond. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that incidentally, that's part of the reason why uh, I always kind of go with Sean Connery and Daniel Craig over, say, uh, Roger Moore per se. Is that, and and this is why I like like their early movies to begin with. In Especially in Casino Royale, Doctor No from Russia with Love, uh, Quantum, Skyfall. Bond gets his ass kicked. In, in, in the Roger Moore era, especially, and to a certain degree, and Pierce Brosnan, not so much towards the end, but certainly at the beginning. Uh, Bond almost, you know, he goes through all this and almost doesn't get a hair out of place. Right. But in the early in the early Sean Connery ones, and definitely in the Daniel Craig ones, he gets the crap kicked out of him. Right. And um, while Bond is always kind of uh, a superhero in his own right, he was never supposed to be superhuman. Right. Fleming kind of based it off of, uh, I think, based a lot off of himself and his exploits in the OSS during the war. Uh, and and. and and Fleming just wanted him to be like an everyman, sort of. He, he, he never intended for him to be like this Superman. But as the movies got more and more over the top, um, he almost became like a Superman. Yeah. Where he, could, where he would get attacked and all this other stuff, and he was just like, okay, and he kind of shrugs it off. But in the other ones, he isn't so much shrugging it off so much as taking the abuse and being kind of like, okay, what else you got? I got some more in the tank. He, he he gets beat up, but he but he it's one of those takes a licking but keeps on ticking kinds of things. Definitely. And for a while that was lost in the series, which is why I really love the Daniel Craig movies. I mean, he gets beat up at the beginning of uh, Die Another Day when he's in the prison before he's released. Oh, well, like I said, near the tail end of uh, of Pierce Brosnan's period, you, I mean he. Spends the like the first half of uh, the world is not enough with a broken collarbone or a broken shoulder or something like that. Yeah. And then the whole opening of Dying of the Day, he's spending years getting just the crap kicked out of him. Right. By a North Korean you know prison crew. 
So he, he definitely takes it, takes his abuse, but right. not not the same way as in Doctor No or Casino Royale. Sure. So we've got Sean Connery, Daniel Craig, Pierce Brosnan, Timothy Dalton, Rudy Roger Moore, and George Lazenby fall in. That order. That order. Yep. George Lazenby only got the one shot, though. No, I know, and, and and frankly, a lot of people hate that movie. I love that movie. Yeah. Because that one is also pretty grounded. I mean, he doesn't really have many gadgets. In fact, uh, one of my favorite things is straight from the book. In fact, it's one of the closest of the movies to the books uh, that you've got. Uh, and when he's sitting there, he, and he escapes, you know, Piz Gloria. He's like, uh, i got to ski back down to the city in order to, to escape. And he's got no gloves. He's sitting there in frigid temperatures. He's got nothing. So pulls his pockets out rips them off and uses them as gloves. I mean, I love that kind of resourcefulness that he shows in that one. Yeah. Well, we'll see where the series goes and keeps going. Um, we'll have to meet up again and pick another movie, another Bond movie, to uh, kickstart another conversation. But uh, this has been pretty thorough. <laughs> Clearly you're thing. a fan. Uh, well, two last things. <laughs> uh, first... The spider scene? Yes. Uh, I don't know if this is a little-known fact, but Sean Connery has arachnophobia. So that scene, where he's sitting there sweating bullets <laughs> as the spider's weird. crawling up his arm, that's real. He was terrified of that thing. The only thing that bugs me about that scene is when he the, so the spider crawls up his shoulder, gets onto the pillow, and he jumps out of bed, and he starts you know, whacking the thing to kill it, is the music notes to emphasize him hitting the spider makes it comical. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, kind of. And it's like, I understand why they did it, and, you know, it's just, you know, it definitely fit for the 60s, but it also just makes it less serious of a moment. Like, you're like you know, you see the guy being given the spider by um, Dr. No. No, the voice of Doctor No. <laughs> I like, incidentally, I like how he tells Professor Dent to, to pick up, and, and he's kind of sitting there staring at. Yeah. And he go, he 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 tells him the first time, and, and this to me kind of conveys just how he is so evil that he doesn't raise his voice. Right. He scares people that much. He's just like pick it up. Yeah. So, you know, you obviously know this is you know, a, a, you know, lethal. If the spider bites you, you're gonna probably gonna die. So it's just like, you know, they build up all this tension with it you know, crawling up his, his arm and his shoulder and everything, that when he hits it, it's just like, I get it. I, you don't need to add those little, like, notes to emphasize that he's whacking and killing this spider. And it wouldn't surprise me back then that he actually did kill that spider. John Carter sure. was terrified of that thing. I'm sure. Uh, and my other little tidbit. Um, the scene where the three blind mice are chasing him in the hearse and it falls down the mountainside and the construction worker is like, what happened? And he's like, it seems they're on their way to a funeral. The director basically told him to just kind of just say whatever. Say whatever comes into your mind. And it kind of came out as like that quip. So the whole history of him making quips like that essentially spawned from an accident. <laughs> it's, it's spawned from him at living that line. So he, ever, he never says things like that in the books, or uh, at least in the original Fleming ones? I'm sure the authors of modern Bond tales have kind of adapted some of that language from the movies into the books, but... Not really. I mean, he wasn't like that. Uh, I, I, think, I think, for example, um, if, if I remember correctly, the, the shocking scene, I'm pretty sure that line was straight from the book, if I remember <laughs> correctly. But, like, a lot of the, the, the flippant nature that he has with some of those things, re, you know, weren't originally written into the story, but they kind of spawned off of that line that he, that he said in Dr. No. So something that's rather iconic with him, it just kind of happened by accident. Gotcha. That's very interesting. We'll see after where they take that in the movies to come. You know, I can't... I guess he has a couple of those in the Daniel Craig ones, but nothing nothing stands out. Can't think of any off the top of my head. 
must be one or two in there. Um, because it is the iconic bond now to say things like that. But he said we'll have to pick a whether it be the next movie when Bond twenty four comes out, or uh, maybe pick a, a different movie. You want to you know, pick your favorite Roger Moore one, and we'll uh, have to do another Bond cast. I like that Bond cast. I like that. <laughs> All right. Well, that'll wrap it up for this episode of Movie Night Spotlight. I'm your host Dave Lindsay. I'm Liam O'Leary. Have a good one. What up? A-